This is Pastor Trevor. We're getting ready to launch our next episode with you. And before we launch that episode, we've got something real new that we couldn't put in the episode, but we want you to see it now for the first time ever in season three. We have an affiliate advertising partner, and that is slnt.com. And before we launch our show in just a minute or so, we want to introduce you to them. You'll be finding out more about them this season. But right now, before we launch this incredible show, check out this advertisement from our new partners at slnt.com. You want to be a part of this, and then stay tuned for the next on the dock with Pastor Troy and the gang. Here we go. There are more than 8 billion phones in the world, a fact that threatens your privacy, security, and health. With Silent Pocket Faraday protection, you can regain control over your mobile devices. We get it. Privacy and security are inconvenient topics. And you may feel like you have nothing to hide, but the fact is that in the modern world, your laptop is never really off. Your phone emits a signal, even in airplane mode. And everything from your passport to your credit cards contains RFID. And all of it contains valuable private information that is easily exploited in the wrong hands. Silent Pocket offers a range of products you already use. Wallets, bags, travel gear, laptop sleeves, key cases. But with the added protection of our patented Faraday technology, which turns your devices invisible and safe from the outside world. Many industries, from top business professionals government officials require the use of Faraday products for the day-to-day -day security of them and their staff. They understand that we are constantly at risk and take the necessary steps to prevent future attacks. We offer this elite technology to anyone that values their personal data, and we are proud to offer a premium range that fits seamlessly into your everyday life, providing security without looking like a tinfoil hat. As we learn to live with technology, Silent Pocket stands on the three pillars of privacy, security, and health. Our goal is to provide harmony with mobile technology without risking our most valuable information. We hope you'll trust us to help you do the same. And you're on the dock here with Pastor Troy and the gang. We can't say cool on the gang anymore. Our attorneys advise us that that's already been booked out on the dock.org every Tuesday and Thursday. We're all about conversations. We're going to have an incredible conversation here that will propel hopefully your faith out of the shallows and into the deep. We had an incredible first episode in this series. I, I expect just another good one. Get ready to go here. We're at YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. You can watch us both TV. You can see our faces and Spotify, iTunes, audio only. Google Play, also audio. Facebook, you can see us. Roku, Rumble, and Sermonette. We house all of our stuff on SermonNet and YouTube, so you can go back and watch all of season one, all of season two. We have like 70 episodes in season one and season two. We're going to shoot about 70 in this season, so we're doing really well here. We've got over 300 out there because we come back with our best of, but those are repeats, so we won't count those, but we're doing well. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, and Getter is our social media network. We'd love for you to get out and reach out through that. If you reach out to us and have questions, comments, maybe you want to share your own testimony or story, we'd love to hear from it, and uh, we, we will get you connected. If you can't get connected, if you don't find the links here, just reach out to us. But if not, I will also, in our show notes, give you ways to find our guest today. Also, hit subscribe, like, notify. And the more popular you are, the more comments you make on our shows, especially the YouTube feed, Facebook feed, uh, they like us better. We like you better. Everybody likes everybody better. Go to my Patreon, download the app, my Patreon, and you can look up on the dock with Pastor Troy. And we have four levels of partnership where you can give different levels of money and we we, we enter into partnership with you. And to the, this episode, Donna is not on camera, not on mic, because, well, normally she's using mic number four, but we've got four at the table today. So Donna's left out. So you could be a Patreon partner and be the reason that Donna is seen again on a next episode of On the Dock. There's three levels of sponsorship for your organization, your business. We'd love to work with you. If you've got a Christian organization or business, we'd work with you as a sponsor as well. We've got a brand new partner out there, slnt.com, promo code OTD. You check that out in our opening today. Faraday Bags, 
check all this out. It's very interesting stuff. They found us because Google heard us. So you'll have to go back and watch that in the previous episode. We told that story. We'll be telling you more about it in the days to come. Go to slnt.com promo code OTD or download uh, down or go to the page slnt.com backslash discount backslash OTD. You can find that in our show notes today on YouTube and you can link over to it that way or go to our website. We'll have it up there as well. We're at on the doc.org. You can find all the links to all our platforms and you can email us at info at on the doc.org. If you have any questions in studio today, I've got my incredible co-host. Uh, he's not lovely anymore. He's just Dan piles. Dan, thank you for being my host again. Thank you so much for having me. I, when you were talking about bringing in, um, raising the funds for Donna, I hit hashtag bring back Donna. Bring, for some hashtag reason, bring back mind. Donna. Hashtag bring back Donna. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Hashtag and do that at my Patreon. <laughs> if yeah, we we'd be, love to have you. So we've got Donna. Donna's here. I'll put her up. Donna Karneski. I get that. I never get it right. And, and and she is our tech today. She's also our executive producer for the show, but she's a tech today, and she is running the show well today. And uh, Mother Beth was supposed to be here today. Eventually, she's showing up. She's getting her hair done. So it's holiday time. We're dating the show a little bit, but she's getting her hair done. And she told me, "No way." I said, "So I got an empty seat." And I thought I'll bring Dan in because Dan's my co-host. He's not working for y'all right now, so just ignore it. He's my co-host, so don't worry. He'll be back on the other side soon. So we'll hear more about his story a little bit, but we're in taking it to the street spotlight. We're spotlighting take action today. And we are in part two of that series. And we're going to be doing the backstory here in this episode. We're going to get further into what they're doing. Um, one of the things that Donna asked, and she's one of our um, people that makes sure that we don't miss things. Uh, she asked about uh, take action. Take action is a faith-based 501c3 non-for-profit aimed at uh, recovery resource capacity, correct? And you're in, man, from Mount Vernon to Southern Illinois, all the way across. So so where was that, Mount Vernon, you said? Yep, Mount Vernon, uh, Mount Vernon, Benton, West Frankfurt, DeCoin, Johnson City, Marion, and Carbondale. Fantastic. And, and so you can find them. Let me go right here. Takeactiontoday.net. That'll be in the show notes. Facebook.com backslash T-A-T dot Southern S-O dot Illinois I-L. You can go there. You can email them at recovery at takeactiontoday.net as well. And you just heard from Mike Tyson from episode one. He is the founder and executive director of Take Action Today. Mike, welcome back. Yeah, thank you for Yeah, and back. you've got, we, we've added a guest, a co-guest, yeah, yeah, co well. Crystal Cantrell. How about that? Look at that. You look great there. You don't have, we. we it, I, it's the beanie. Yeah, I just thought you had no hair here. They put the beanie on you, you just had something kind of sticking out the top there, but we found out you have hair. Yes. So it's great to know that. <laughs> She's you, the streets. You are the director of operations, so we've got both of you in the seat. Yeah. That's right. What so 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 if you're the founder and executive director, what what would that make her? Uh, Crystal is the assistant director. So she's like you, next to you. Yep. So if you're Moses, she's Aaron. Yep. Okay, so that would make and that's her. So that that's her. Yeah, yeah, I got that. <laughs> no, I got that. Yeah. Listen, so that makes you Captain Picard, and that's number. She would. This would be Riker. Riker, number yeah, one. I'm number lost. One. Number one. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know how Trekkie? I have no idea. No, what you, you guys are talking. He, but he got it. He got it. You're number yeah. one. Basically, he's Spock. She's Spock. Well, yeah, yeah. Riker was cooler. Riker had a beard. You could do Riker. That's a great analogy because she is definitely the logic and reason. Behind so she's a more thing. Spock. Yeah, she's what keeps us between the navigation. Absolutely. Beacons. Absolutely. Isn't that good to have a Spock? You need somebody to kind of do your Spock stuff. You don't want too many of them though. Well, yeah. But Absolutely. you need the reason, a sound reason. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I, tell, spot, I have a couple study. in our staff. Donna is good sound reasoning for me. Yeah. Tracy is our business manager. She's the most, she's the bean counter. So they'll, she'll tell me stuff like, we can't afford this. I said, we're going to do it. She said, she said, I know you can raise the money. I'm not worried about that. I just wanted you to know we couldn't afford it. She said, now you know you got to raise the money while you do it, right? Yeah. So that's okay. I, I, you, know, you know how it is as a director. Yeah. You sometimes just the Lord tells you to do something. You're going to do it, yeah. you know, and, and the Lord will provide. It, the water doesn't split sometimes till you put your toe in the water, then it splits. Yeah. So, but, and, and what I like about like Tracy is she said, I just want to know you knew that. She says, because I know the water is split for you if God told you. That's right. You know, that's the kind of people you need. Now, if you had 12 of those, you'd want to you'd run for the hills. <laughs> you couldn't handle them all. Well, I mean, people, right. people wouldn't want you showing up at their light party. Can you imagine going to a party of nothing but Vulcans? It would just be <laughs> terrible. It'd be boring. This is starting to feel like on the dock episode. This is what we typically <laughs> do here. This is how we got J.G. Wentworth. Oh, my gosh. You Get your Faraday bag, slnt.com, promo code 
OTD. You'll find out why you need that if you watch his show. You're going to get triggered with a lot of advertising. All right, we're going to get into this. So, Crystal, tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your background a little bit. Welcome. Thanks. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. Uh, me too. I was a little boy. I didn't remember none of it. Oh, I, I just moved to Southern Illinois in 2014. Um, but I, I grew up in a household where it was alcoholism and domestic violence. My grandparents raised me. My uncle lived there. Um, my mom gave me away when I was three to wow. her parents. Um, my dad did not think I was his because he is from a family of seven boys and only one girl. So uh, he thought I wasn't his. So that's how I ended up at my grandparents because my dad was uh, a heroin addict. And uh, so my mom thought it would be safer for me to go to the domestic violence alcohol versus at least she thought they weren't going to. She was like the lesser of two evils. Yes, exactly. I didn't oh. find that out till years later. What a tough choice. I, What's I, that? What a tough choice. What, what a tough choice. Yeah, I mean, yeah. did you have any good choice in there? Was there when you look back? Well, I didn't know until I found some letters when my mom passed that she had tried. I was wondering why she didn't try to get me back when she was doing better and she left him and met my stepdad. Um, come to find out, she did try to get me back. But by then, my grandparents were so attached to me. They were like, nah, she's staying here with us. We're attached wow. now. Does that, change, does, that, does that help knowing that a little bit now? Yeah. No, yeah. A lot now? Oh, yeah. And you realize sure. your mom made a great sacrifice. Yes. At, at a great cost to her with yes. you. Yeah. Yes. As we get older, we, we see some of those things differently, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know, it still hurts at the time. doesn't change the pain. doesn't change that. Fantastic. I mean, yeah. Chicago. So you just recently got down in this area. Uh, 2014, yep. And, and you're uh, a Chargers fan? Okay, the Chargers thing started when I was in, like, 7th or 8th Well, we don't grade. like the Bears down here, so that's okay. I mean, we're glad. Oh, we're I don't like the Bears. Yeah, either. they suck. I don't like the Bears the either. The Cubs, the White Sox, all that bunch. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, well, oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Though. No St. Louis either. Sorry. Oh, no. no we're Cardinals no, fans, no. but strictly no. Steelers on this side. No. Denver over here. AFC at least. Yes. Yes. Everyone <laughs> on our staff uh, likes a different football team. Pretty <laughs> it makes much, it so interesting, it right? It does make yeah. it interesting. I think we should have a wear your jersey day kind of thing. I don't know, but. Well, give us, a, I'll come back over to Mike's story because you're doing so well right now. Did, did, with everybody around you in some form of addiction or some sort of issue going on, did you follow right into the, that hole naturally? How did you, how were you, how were you the director of operations for a recovery ministry? Uh, God put me there. Wow. That's why God moved me to Southern Illinois. That's probably why uh, I had to go through my addiction and all my trauma and all the generational curses because I do believe I'm at a point in my life where I no longer need to read The Purpose Driven Life because I finally have the answer to that and I believe I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I oh, just think I fantastic. took it. I just think I took the long way to get there though. Fantastic. I mean, just, the pro just the process. Yeah, just the process. Absolutely. Mike, tell us a little bit about how, how did, I mean, you said you, you gave us a difference between almost 23 years between you being in addiction and kind of, I mean, getting to hear Tell us from 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 where you were to here. What, what did that look like? What? How did you become Spider Man? Well, it looked just like how Spider Man swings through the swings <laughs> through the city in a bunch of different directions. Man, I was all, I've been all over the place too. Uh, life's been very seasonal for me as God's progressed me and I've grown as an individual. Uh, just put me in different spaces and in different places that led me to this. It's a really unique journey from. You know, from being uh, a homeless crack addict in the 90s to going to an extremely, uh, an extremely uh, dis di disciplined discipleship program in right. the Adult and Teen Challenge, uh, to being in the coal mines for more than 10 years, to then going to school at 45, and now I'm in a not-for-profit. So you, you came out of the coal mines to, the not, to, to take action today? Yeah, pretty that much. That was your last work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I worked in the coal mines up until 2016. Um, I lost my job over Christmas break on my day off for sleeping on the job. But uh, that's what coal miners, and suddenly that was what they claimed they were best at. Well, that's what sleeping I Sleeping without getting caught. Yeah, that's what I thought, especially my job. I had this job called I was a mine examiner, and it was like literally in our job description that we were supposed to take naps on the job when our job was done. Well, apparently my management skipped that chapter, so they felt like I needed one of those uh, solo person layoffs. 
Um, so on January 1 of 2016, I lost my job in the coal industry. A six-figure income was removed from my family. Didn't know what to do and had the greatest peace ever in my life. Wow. I, I shook their hands with a smile on fi- my face knowing God was moving me to something different. If, if, if I'll be honest with you, I, I'm claustrophobic. Mm-hmm. I can do heights better than depths. And I cannot even get in a, like a CAT scanner, that little the burrito one. I have to go to the large one where it just looks like it's going to smash you and kill you. You ever seen the open MRI? It still looks like it's going to kill you because it looks like it's going to fall on you. Yeah. But it's a little bigger. But when they, I mean, even on like, my doctor said, we'll give you some Ativan. <laughs> no, it's not enough. You know? So I've already told him if I have to go medically here and they do that, they have to sedate me to do it because I'm going to, I'm going to hurt somebody i can't I, I i went and tried to get in it two times i can't do it and i'm a grown man with rational thinking and all this stuff i can't do it it just looks like right you know and it just does and it just if i had to go in a coal mine i would have turned to drugs sooner yeah I, I couldn't i couldn't do what coal miners do yeah i thank god for them and the people are able to go down and work in those depths but i could not do that job I, my great my great grandpa charlie the whole benetton family moved from italy to here to go to new mexico first to mine before it was a state we came here to mine so all my family before me came here to mine from italy uh, i could not do that if that was my lot, lot in life it'd be it'd be terrible so so tell me you, teen challenge now teen challenge i mean i'm aware of aa i've never been in a my dad's in an aa group right now and he's a recovering alcoholic he's doing relatively well the last three four years he spent most of his life especially the latter half of his medical career knowing as he was coming to any drink more and more and more and when he quit being a doctor regularly then he just turned completely to scotch and then his, his his life turned really to crap and beyond crap and and then he finally started he he got to the worst we, we, he was going to kill himself with just the liver bleeding and all that stuff and the doctor finally told him you drink one more time like you just drank you're probably dead we took him to a rehab program he peed on everything did stupid stuff and he, he kind of got put in a program and he kind of peed on the wall, peed on the nurses, peed on stuff till they threw him out. So he, and we got called and said, you're going to come pick your dad up. I said, I'm not picking him up. Yeah. I called all my siblings. We're not picking him up. He finally got somebody else that was already his drinking buddy to pick him up. You know, that type of thing. And, uh, I, I didn't think my dad, I, I just didn't want to help. I just, I'm done with him. He can't get fixed. My, my dad, I forgot how strong his will was as a surgeon to be what he was. Yeah required discipline and he finally just turned on his own and went in a group and quit mm-hmm. and so i am proud of the fact That's that my awesome. dad's the, he, he flipped that switch and he's beat that finally good deal and you know and he, he, he's fighting through that so he's been in recovery i think he told me two years he just got his two year or three year deal yeah. and that's his whole life so but but teen challenge I worked with some teen challenge teen challenge had a huge effect on me in 1989 90, 91, 92. When I was with No Greater Love, we'd, we'd do trips to New Orleans to, with No Greater Love Ministries to share the gospel on the streets. And we got working with Teen Challenge for a few years, and their singing groups would travel down and meet us there. Oh, yeah. And they would march with us. They would come in with us, and they would do, they would, we'd get on the street, we'd, we'd be sharing the gospel, we'd set the cross up. Those guys would get around that cross, start singing. Absolutely. You know, on Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. I saw, we were in the darkest section of the homo, homosexual quarter part, St. Peter's and, and, and Bourbon Street. The darkest area where people, this is in the 80, 90, 91, 92, people dressed and leather chaps and their butt cheeks hanging out and and they're leading each other like a dog and it's, it's just reprobate to the max it looked like the entire village of people village people right. it was rough looking so we're, we went down there one time and we were carrying the cross through 300 men going through sharing jesus he paid a debt we're singing and finally three guys in the village people dress outfit blocked us and they wouldn't let us do it you know some of those guys can you know that they're not right they're they've worked out a lot and, you know, <laughs> they got in front of us and wouldn't let us march through. And we're yeah. thinking, oh, we have a, in No Greater Love Ministries, when we're marching through Bourbon Street, we do that every night. Yeah. And we always decide if somebody's going to block us, they must want to hear more. Yeah. Let us go through. You just have to hear Amazing Grace like 10 times through. Yeah. If you block us, we're going to keep singing. Yeah. So they blocked us. They didn't want us to go on through. And we thought, well, great. We, so what we do is we stop. We just set the cross up instead of carry it. And now we get around it. And that year we had Teen Challenge with us. And I was in the quarter. You're going to love this. Teen Challenge came up and they said, well, it's our turn. So they got up around the cross and started to sing on Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. Right. They had a version of that that was just jamming, man, jamming. I had their tape for years. Cannot find it to this day. And they sang this song. And while, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm, I was in the darkest part of the quarter on, 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 on Tuesday. Yeah. On Fat Tuesday, a ray of light hit the cross. It hit like a nuclear bomb. And you, the light went out, and we were all driven to our knees. They, they had 
gathered around the cross and all put their hands on the cross. And we're singing the, 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 the last verse of On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. And, and that burst hit. And the people next to me were the ones in the chat with naked booties and helmet. One guy was wearing just a football helmet with a jock strap. That was like common dress in those days. It was rough. You know, and, 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 and they, you know, they were kneeling with me. When the Bible says every one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus yes. is Lord, it was a moment. It was that, for that space, light hit. And I looked at the dude and said, what are you doing? He says, I can't stand. I said, neither can I. He says, what's happening? I said, the presence of the Lord is here. Right. And, and, and our leader got up and preached and shared the gospel. And almost every one of us that were kneeling next to somebody led that person to Christ. Yeah. Wow. That's it was awesome. just boom, teen moment. challenge. They Because those guys that all come out of it, they were rough out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that that little bit of part of your life. Well, um, when I got on a bus in 2000 to go to t uh, Teen Challenge, I started off in a place in Ar Hot Springs, Arkansas. I had less than half of a bag of ratty clothes, a trash bag full <laughs> of clothes. was all I had to my name, only possessions I had. Um, and so I got on that board. Teen Challenge took me with no resources, no money. Um, I was suicidal about wow. four or five months prior to that. Um Come, leading up to the end of 2019, um, I had a court appointment for just some petty drug charge. Uh, I think it was like a roach or something like that. Um, and I was I was so ready to change my life. I had this moment in the backseat of a car with a gun in my lap um, that really was a turning point for me. Wow. I feel like. But I had no resources and no support to build a new life with. So I basically begged a judge to put me in prison, told him that's where I belonged, had nothing else to do. No greater, no resources, and was not going anywhere in life. And I had had this pattern of build something up, tear it down, build something up, tear it down, to where this judge, fortunately for me, I was so blessed that day. God had seen fit to put an advocate in the courtroom that day that knew about Teen Challenge. Mm -hmm. He came forward, asked the judge to speak with me. He worked with me the next two months. I, I voluntarily sat in jail the next two months because I told the judge, I said, if you put me out on the streets, I won't go. But he worked with me. They got me into this program. And on January 2000, 2000 I got on a bus with that, that half a trash bag of clothes and started this journey. How does that get you? You come, you, you end up in the mines. Mm -hmm. You come out of the mines. And then then, how do you get to take action today? Because you, you, you would have been at the bottom. Yeah. You, you had yourself in a trash bag. Yeah. And you're a miner in Southern Illinois. You're making a hundred grand back in the mining days here. I mean, you're making serious money. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you didn't have to have your education. You just had to be able to go down there and That's work right. hard. That's right. right. Yeah. So you've got everything and now you're out of the mines. You could almost, I mean, what do you do? Some people could go back to the trash bag, but you chose to do a ministry that helps other people get rid of trash bags. Yeah. So this is where the journey takes a really spiritual turn. Um, at this time when I lost my job in 2016, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I knew that I was done with that season in my life. Mm -hmm. I knew that I didn't want to go back to coal mining, didn't want to be a part of it. Um, fortunately, God had put me in a place where my family was not as dependent on that income as we could have been. You know, God was uh, God was putting things in order well in advance. Um, so when I left, I actually tried to be a salesman. I was a horrible salesperson. I was such a bad salesperson. I got in such a horrible depression because I couldn't sell anything. You even pointed out to me the other day, I'm horrible at asking for money. So yeah, right off the bat, man, I'm a terrible salesperson. <laughs> but what I can do is build relationships with people. Yes. I can make connections with people. No, you're, you're, you're fantastic with, with that. Look, hey, pause one second here. Yeah, yeah. Take action today. I'm going to do this for you. Take action today .net. You go to their site right now and they have a donate link. I was on it this morning myself, click donate, and I want you to go in there and I want you to think about it. If you've ever struggled with this and you've got a victory side of this, I want you to plant a seed back in their ministry to help somebody else out. You can be up here helping somebody else get out. You may not be a counselor, you may not be trained to do what these guys are doing yet, but you could partner with them to do that. So go to the do do donate link. It's a PayPal link, right? Correct? I think I saw that on there. So check that out and do that because they need resources. He's not gonna ask for it, he's really bad at that. I went to his gala. I went to his gala and the gala was fantastic. Beautiful. Beautiful gala. Place was great. All of y'all were fantastic. Dan, you were strong speaking up there. You were great. The team was great. What was beautiful was watching the layers of leadership. And I talked to you about this at lunch. Was I got there, I had I really didn't know what to expect. Dan and Rebecca just called and invited me to go. And I thought I already told Beth. I called Beth and and told her whatever we're doing, I don't want to hear any any excuses. 
they, I'm thank God it wasn't a haircut. We'd had a fight because <laughs> Beth's gone right now. She never misses a show. But she's getting her hair done, you know. So if it had been that, our marriage could have been over. But I called her and said, "Whatever you're doing, we, I know we're coming oh, back. We we were coming back from Memphis from an event. We had to f race back to get. But I said we're going to this because I'm wanting to connect with Mike's ministry. I'd already met you. I liked what you're doing. I love what you're doing. And and I just wanted to go see. I know what how I do galas. I wanted to see the people." And we were just mesmerized. First of all, the place was beautiful. Secondly, the food was great. Third of all, the people you had represented every tier from just out and being trained at the core level, like like just out. You know, you could tell it's like their first time to put on a dress outfit in a while, yeah. you know, to, to somebody like yourself that's been out a while, to somebody like Dan, we'll talk about Dan a little bit later, but, but years are recovering now. And, and you've got people at tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, and you could just see the progress they're making. It's almost like pretty rough, but they're up. Wow. And you go next level, next year. Wow, what a change. And then, and what's cool is in the back of his gala, he has like all these, we'll talk about this later, drug court. I, I didn't know there was a drug court. I, I just thought there was yeah. courts. But the, she, he has all these judges here that you're working with, you're partnering mm -hmm. with. The judges, judges are snoopy people. They're like, they're judges. They're like, they are mesmerized. They are so excited to see success. They're, they're seeing people that they may not see in their court for that reason again for a while. Yeah. Everybody fails and mistakes and goes back. Absolutely. But they were, it was like they were grandparents. I mean, I watched them. They had a good time. You had the sheriff there. You had, normally when the sheriff comes and you got people all drug addicts, they're like, oh, we got to get out of here, you know? <laughs> Nobody. They were, I mean, I mean, your best fans was was the sheriff and the, the, the mayor of Benton was there. And, and it, you had people there. So state's he had all attorney. the state's attorney. I mean, mm -hmm. he had everybody there. I mean, he had people from Marion, leaders, good speakers. And and then all I got is this one little card on, the, on my table about how I could give some money. And nobody even mentioned the card. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I did tell him in our lunch meeting, I said, I volunteer next year to come and do your ask for money. <laughs> there you go. Not, not because I'm good at it, because I, I have seen the layers and I've yeah. seen, I've heard you, I've seen Dan and Rebecca in their lives, yeah. and I, I, I'm seeing what God's doing in you. And I would be enthusiastic to challenge you go right now to donate at Take Action Today and do something. So, and we'll do better than that then. So go ahead, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, so how you got there. Something that you just touched on. So it would be one thing for me to get up there and ask for money <laughs> to support my organization, right. my not-for-profit. But when I have people that have been through our program, yeah. people who are thriving in our program, because like I said, our program doesn't just earlier, our program doesn't just serve our participants, it serves our staff. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. To. When you see them thriving like that, to have them ask, Mm -hmm. or to have somebody like yourself come in and ask. Yeah. People outside of our organizations that find the value in Absolutely. our organization to be so great that they will come ask the money for right. us. Oh, oh, I'd be that's glad a, to. That's a special place. Oh, well, and here's the deal. It's an easy ask. Yeah. I, I don't want to go first. I want to go right toward the end because I'm going to go, see? Exactly. Now give. <laughs> it, it would be the, e your ask is the easiest ask because the room demonstrates yeah. the value of it. Yeah. And so I think I left the gala. We left, we were tired but we were blessed to have been there. And I, he knows I talked about it the next morning. Yeah. And I, 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 I mean, I go to galas and stuff, but it was well done. It was just great to see I success. That. No, it's fantastic. But I will help you with the ask next year. And you may not want me to ask again after that. I don't care. But I really think people need to sow seed in that. And uh, people, you know, I, I'm excited about that. So uh, let's get into this a little bit. You, you got into TAT yeah. and, and, and now you're doing all these things. Uh, uh, I'm going to well, ask the if, question. If I can back you up just a go little ahead, bit. Go ahead. I, I, I wanted to talk about this because this was such an important moment in us getting started. And it was probably one of the coolest things that I've ever been a part of as an individual and as a Christian. So um, there was such a buildup to us getting this started that, that people don't see, that people don't even know about now. Um, such as this two-year period where I didn't really have a career, didn't really have a job, was wondering knew God had, had so you had two years in this gap between yes, and knew that God had okay. released me from this coal experience but didn't know where he was going I met a young pastor who had just been who who was only in our community for a brief period of time just a couple of years and he was gone to do something else a uh, former missionary over in Africa um, but he there was something different about the guy I started hanging out with him and it just kind of rubbed off on me and I found myself in a place in the summer of 2018 
um, doing a lot of praying and fasting for direction in my life. Really wanted, you know, God, you brought me here. You told me I was released from this career. Where am I going now? What's next? What's next? I fully trust you, you know. Um, but month goes by, nothing happens. So at the time, and I'm not going to mention the church by name, but I went to a very bland church. I mean, wow. you know how when you go to somebody's house and they make you that that chicken in the oven that's just got salt and pepper on it? Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> yeah, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit dry, takes all the moisture <laughs> out of your mouth. Yeah. You know, but it's still, it's sustenance, and it's not bad. It's actually kind of good some. It's just bland, you know? That was the kind of church that I was going to. Absolutely <laughs> no movement of God it felt like. Yeah. But we're having this. We're having worship no as normal at the end of at the end of service, you know, and the and the worship team's doing a good job, and they're singing the Lauren Daigle song, yep. you know, about the Valley of yep. Dry Bones, you wow. know. And Love anytime it. I've ever read that story before or heard this song before, it's always from the perspective of the prophet, you know, yeah. you know, sp speaking the word of God to this valley and this army of dry bones rising up, you know, to do God's work. Well, in that moment, I realized that I was that valley of dry bones. Wow, that's that, that I had sat on a church pew for about 15 years from that point, from a radical salvation moment where I had committed my life to God and told him that I will serve you till the last of my days. And I'm sitting there in that church group and they're singing this, you know, and I'm having this revelation, you know, that I've become this dry bones, you know. Um, and God kind of speaks to me and he reminded me of that commitment I made on that night with a gun in my lap at the point of suicide. You know, I told him, I said, God, if you change my life, because I've tried so many times to change my life, if you will change it, I will serve you the rest of my days. Wow. You know, and this is back in 2019. And he did his part, you know, and he called, he called my commitment right there at that point. He says, so are you still going to do it? Are you still committed to this? Right. And if you've ever been asked a question like that by God, you know, there's only one real answer, right. you know, and no is not it. Cause right. you know what happens. We know right. what happens to people when they say, well, no you God. become Jonah. I just read <laughs> yeah, Jonah, yeah, Jonah this last <laughs> week. You got to go, you got to go, exactly. the fish. you got to go through the, you go around and around and around till you, till you deal with God. Exactly. And the only time in my life where I felt like God had put a word in my heart and in my mind and in my spirit. And he said, you are that Valley of dry bones and I'm going to breathe a new breath into you. Fantastic. And we are going to raise up an army in Southern Illinois and we are going to march against what has happened. And it's going to be with wow. the people who have lost their lives to this. Yes. And, and then and, within and, a brief and, time, and, we started to take action. And, there, and there's a, I, I guess I want, I want you to help define this a little bit. We're going to get deeper into this in the second, in this next episode, but, but I want to, Southern Illinois has a significant, um, we may not be populated like Chicago, but we have a lot of blue and despair and a lot of um, just a lot of depression, a lot of despair, despair, a lot yeah. of despair. Cause there were a lot of people here that were coal miner rich, mm -hmm. uh, blue collar, but making white collar yeah. money. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, I know this from my wife's from DeCoin. You know, I grew up around here. I grew up in Memphis and different places, but my, my, my family's all from here and, and they were all coal miners and you know, they had a camper, a boat, a lake house at the Lake of Egypt. They had their house. You know, they, they went to Disney. They, they, they live very well. I mean, they, they got time off. They got everything paid. They had the best medical care. Their, their teeth were perfect. Their, their eyesight was perfect. And I watched the coin lose some of those first early. I watched that the most because even while I was in seminary, the mines were leaving. They were, they were peeling out. And I began to watch the same coal miners off of their jobs now on not working, maybe doing a real roof job on the side, start turning to alcohol, turn into drugs, uh, all of a sudden, their perfect teeth, they couldn't get checked. Their perfect eyes, they couldn't see. Right. Uh, they weren't getting medically treated. It's like they reverted back into, it was like they went, they just kind of became almost bums. Mm -hmm. You know, no hope. No. Yeah. And that, I think, began to infect towns like DeCoin. Yes. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that when I started doing this that I started, I started understanding about Southern Illinois is that while we have a lot of pride as a, as a culture ourselves, in a lot of ways, we are a flatland Appalachia. Yes, we're, we're a region that was dominated by the coal industry, mm -hmm. um, predominantly high poverty, low education, a lot of blue collar workers, a lot of disability mm -hmm. because of that heavy industrial right. labor. And then when those jobs wash up or wash away, what comes in? Opioid use comes in. Right. Methamphetamine use. Comes because because the, the kind of money that in. they were paid to go underground yeah. was was a super money. Yep. But, but then when that's gone, it's gone. There's a big void. Now they have no purpose. Yeah. They have no meaning. And, they and have no, no new jobs coming in income. like that ever. Yep. You know. So they have a choice. The ones that, the ones that are willing to move away to another area where they can work. And they could mine income, somewhere else. What's going right? to be right. Or the ones stay here and do what they can to survive. 
So then you have an then you have an epidemic. So we're talking about Southern Illinois, probably back in the late eighties, early nineties. Yep, that's exactly the, what I'm talking about. The Clean Air Act passes and starts wiping out the union coal mines. Yep. So you have all these people that are used to this, like you said, white collar money with a blue collar work ethic, right. and a blue collar lifestyle. Hard working people. I'm blue just telling you. Lifestyle. But yeah. they're living way beyond what they could live with if it wasn't a hole in the ground job. Absolutely, absolutely. But they now they have to survive. You know, so they start turning to other things. So the drugs come in, the trafficking comes in, all of these social issues. Because they're not getting the treatment. Their bodies are beat up, too, from mining. Mining's like playing an athlete. They're hurting, so now you're turning to drugs and and, and just depression. So now during the late 90s and then, so the early 2000s roll around, and the, the, the war on drugs comes to southern Illinois in the form of methamphetamine. Oh, man. You know, and just like what we saw with New York and some of the urban areas in the 80s with the crack epidemic, we come in, we see higher incarceration rates, we see, ex- we see very aggressive policing because we've got to wipe out the scourge of drug addiction. Well, what we end up doing is we lock up a generation's worth of parents. Wow. So now we have their children who are being raised by their grandparents living in trailer parks, living in high poverty. Wow. And now we have the same generational issue that a lot so, of urban and, and new are. wounds because your parents didn't raise yeah. you like you shared. You had other people yep. raising you. Right. So you have a new level. Yep. So you, you had one level of wounds. Now you have a second level. And even worse, now the older pillars of the community that are there are asking you, why can't you do it? I did it. I pulled myself up. My, because my because that group that's in the in the trailer, they were in that greatest generation that, that defied a lot of things. Now, Crystal, you used a word that as a pastor, I understand. But use generational curses. That's what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. This generation Absolutely. puts a curse on the next. Can, can you help people understand f- from a standpoint, it's a spiritual term that, that it, it creates layers. What does that look like? How do you unpack that and, and begin to deal with that? The blood of Jesus Christ breaks it. But unless you walk a new path, you can end up back in that same hole. You just, right. you just said it, uh, walking a new path. So... From what I understand, my grandpa's dad, who built the house I was raised in, there we saw five generations go through that house. It's now no longer in the family. Um, my nieces and nephews were the last generation raised in that house. Wow. So uh, grandpa's family was all alcoholic. Um, when my mom and my dad got together, um, my dad's side of the family was mainly drug addicts, um, and my mom's was alcoholic. So here I am, a product of both of them, genetically. So that the generational curse is applied to you. You're now the, you've got m- that much yes. more baggage. Yes. Let me and, say that way. And and so and then I was raised in the alcoholism. What I can say for sure is that uh, I remember playing bartender being five or six years old where they thought it was cute for me to take collect all the shot glasses on the tray. Um, right. My grandkids, if I can help it, will never, as a joke, be like, take the little taste out of that right. alcohol right. because that's what starts the phenomenon of so, craving. So, so basically, generational curses would be where if, you ha- if, your, if your grandparents had this bag, and then they pass it that bag to their their children, and then you, say you're the granddaughter, and they got a bag, and then you pick up two other bags, and then maybe you got a couple of bags on the other side of your family as well, yes. or you marry into that, and you get a, maybe your spouse is abusive or they had issues. You could end up three generations away with four or five other bags that aren't even well, your bags. And here's oh, yeah. the other thing, and then you swear you're never going to do that with your family going forward. But do you know another way? Well, that's exactly it. So <laughs> I did the exact same thing. Um, you didn't mean to. You didn't. It wasn't your no, desire. No, it wasn't my desire, but I couldn't stop. Once it's again, all you know. Phenomenon of craving. Uh, saw that if I took a little taste of that alcohol, that it helped me to sleep, even at the age right. of six, seven. Can eight, I pause seven? you for one second? Because sure. I think what, that's what you said is perfect. And you, in the first episode, he talked about the rat. Uh, the, the with the, yeah, the two park. things. Right. Well, the rat park was where you just said two things. So at that time you were talking about the two things, but then he talked about rat paradise where all of a sudden there's other choices out there. So at that time, what you're saying is it didn't look like there was other choices. So you just start down that path. Yes. And yes. with that path, you not just take your new addiction. You're carrying the, the generations of stuff that drove you into that. Is yes. it, is it a lot harder when you guys begin to work with somebody that's a first generation, let me just say somebody, I don't know if they, they say, you can say this, somebody that's more first generational, they just kind of started down this path, you know, or, or somebody that's three or four generations into this. Have you, do you have to, is it tougher to unpack that, that person than the other? So I feel like 
if we get someone who says there's never been a history as far as I know, I feel like they can be with the right information and the right tools, which is what we provide, that they can spare themselves 10 or 20 years of because a lot of people a lot of people could do can be that. raised well and they just have a dna proclivity they have a genetic yep. thing and they tend to be more addictive than others and yep. so maybe they had a lot of good things now listen i was you didn't catch this in the first episode but i was raised by a father that always made you know close to six figures five six figures and that's in the 80s my dad was a trauma surgeon uh we were never short for money and it it, it messed me up so having all that you need like a coal miner having all the money isn't necessarily the answer. No. I did, my, my dad did explain to me one time later on, cause we, we were, I was in, in my first, you know, full pastor, not student pastor, making about 30 grand. And, and that, that wasn't a lot of money, but my dad was making about 300 grand. He said, well, this is what I make. And it was, he was making more than that. But, but the point was, was I was very happy. And my dad, I watched my dad be miserable. My dad was almost 10 times miserable. So one day I was saying, well, dad, someday I'll make money like you. He says, you don't want to. And the point was, he says, how much is your utility bill? Well, my 300, he says, mine's 3000. How much is this? So everything I ha he had was 10 times more than mine or, or more. And I began to realize it's not what you make because, because you, sometimes you think the grass is greener for that guy. Yeah. Right. It just creates new pressure for you. Yeah. And that's what was driving my dad to alcoholism yeah. is having to supply that. Yeah. So it's not about the money. It's about the hope. Yes, and I can tell you that, Purpose. so even though I put my daughter through the same thing that I swore I wouldn't, I can tell you, though, that because I was able to uh, find a recovery program, for me, I went to treatment. Uh, for me, I also found the 12-step program, and that's what I used, um, which helped me to get the courage to work on childhood traumas, uh, basically told me there, there was a different way that I could live. I did have some relapses in between, sure. but I can tell you today, I did not follow all of the suggestions. I thought I was different and unique. Uh, and so, um, but I needed that to go back down to see that there's a trap door to rock bottom. But my daughter, uh, she does engage in alcohol use here and there. She doesn't seem to have the problem that I had right. or the gene or whatever you call it. But I can tell you she escapes by things like shopping and, and things like that. There's but, lots of other forms of yes, addiction. A exactly, lot of other things we put right. Exactly. But my grandchildren, all of my seven grandchildren, I have never ever seen me drink, use drugs or smoke a cigarette. That's and awesome. We agreed wow. that it would stop it, it, that's so, it. It so you're stop. actually breaking that curse. Yes, hopefully. And, 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 and in the name of Jesus, we're breaking yes. the curse, yes. stepping forward, hoping that our grandchildren will not inherit yes. those five bags. Yes. Six bags. So what's interesting is that research has actually proven that it's your grandchildren who benefit the most from these behavioral changes. That I agree with now. that. Yeah. I totally agree with you that. Know, yeah. So it's even though my kids will reap a ton of benefit from my new lifestyle, it's my grandkids where that generation. It's going to take a generation actually, to prove that, right. that ba some of that baggage was discharged. Because yeah. yeah. everybody, yeah. every generation has its own bag. Yeah. The question is, how many generations will you carry? Yeah. Right. I got a question for you, Mike. And Crystal, first, I want to say thank you for sharing your story. That's a powerful, I mean, it's powerful. Yeah, it shows powerful. you how we can overcome that yes. we, we do recover. Um, but Mike, when you were sharing your story, kind of like how you got to tap, I honestly, man, felt your passion when you yeah. were talking. I mean, it was really genuine, but was there a specific reason or a specific cause that you seen that made you want to start TAP? Uh, yeah, we had a, one of the things that, like I say, we, we recognize in Southern Illinois, we knew for a long time that we had uh, a huge methamphetamine epidemic. And we've also recognized that we had an opioid epidemic that just exploded in the later 2000s. In 2019, uh, there was a homeless gentleman that passed away in my little town of West Frankfurt. Wow. You know, and like every other community, we see those people that wander around the streets at 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, two or three of them. You know, we all recognize that, hey, you know, that's the bum down the street or whatever. Every community's got one, you know, that old wino or whatever that you saw on the Andy Griffith show or something. These people have always been around. Otis is in every town. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. A lot more than we think, too. Yeah, well, that was the thing, was that mm -hmm. I decided to stop and take a look at what we were actually dealing with as a community. We had a Thanksgiving dinner in 2019 that allowed us to really expose a lot of the issues that we were dealing with in West Frankfurt, and we came face-to-face -face with an exploding homelessness epidemic that really spurred me to take this approach. 
Um, I will, I will, I will tell anybody first and foremost that I'm in recovery from a lot of things, but homelessness is probably one of the hardest things that having to come back from just having Absolutely. to learn a new way of life, having to build. When I talk about getting on that bus with that bag of trash bag, that was literally all I had. No moral or emotional support and having to come back from that is really tricky. Wow. That's, a, that's a, so a lot of yeah. what you guys are doing is both the recovery from substance, but also helping somebody come yes. back into getting him in a housing situation yes. and, and the goals. Let me ask a question. I, 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 this is, I've had several meetings with you guys and, but when you talk about recovery from alcohol or substance abuse or, or, or what have you, do, are any of your, 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 your peers that you're working with, are they coming from pornography or any other thing? Are you getting any from other things, other addiction to phone? I mean, or shopping or maybe what's the hoarders? Are, there, are you getting anything besides alcohol, drug addiction, or is that pretty much the wheelhouse of where you're working? So one of the things that makes us very different at Take Action today is that we don't focus on substance use. We don't focus on the substance that an individual is using. We take a look at the whole person. We take a look at what's going on in their life. You see, we've got this idea in our minds, especially when we use clinical terms like co-occurring, that a person might have mental health challenges and they might have substance use challenges and they're on these parallel pathways. But what's really happening is that they're at this intersection of, the, of multiple conditions. We talk about generational poverty. We talk about lack of education, disability. Then we talk about mental health, substance use homelessness, incarceration, trauma. I mean, the list goes on and on with what we talk about with like generational generational curses. All of these things intersect in a person's experience. So it's not just one or two things that we can deal with. And it can be like a spider graph. Yeah. A spider graph where you have, you can have multiple circles of influence Absolutely. that affected you. Yes, yes, and yes, exactly. It, so let me ask you Do you use spider graph type stuff? Have, have you ever heard? <laughs> That's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we got time. Uh, have you ever heard the term dry drunk? Yes. Okay. So we can put all the substances down, but then I'm still that person. I'm just not using substances. So right. I had experienced that in my first wow. year of recovery. Uh, I did put the substances down, but I didn't completely want to change my people, places, things, my lifestyles. The uh, I would lose a job, but I always got a job. I would, you know, lose my boyfriend, but I'd always find another one. Uh, you know, family doesn't talk to me, but then they'd start talking to me and then start the circle. It's, it's like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So I ran that circle. So for me in the 12-step program, it says, you know, the first step talks about, you know, powerless over the substance, but that your life has become unmanageable. I didn't deal with the unmanageability. So um, I've heard it said that, you know, I'm a dr I was a drunken horse thief. So if I take away the alcohol, now I'm just a horse thief. Well, <laughs> sometimes you can't still yeah. be a horse thief and expect your life to get better. So uh, I had to change pretty much everything and look at what were some of the things that I did that I put myself into that maybe caused me to go down that road. And the substance was just trying to escape reality. I just didn't want to think and feel about some of the things that were going on and it just wanted it to be a temporary thing. Just don't want to think about that right now. Wow. Come to find and out that, I'll... yeah, but like I said, come to find out that um, when I moved to Southern Illinois in Chicago, I could drive a block or two and get to any 12 step meeting. Uh, I know they had celebrate recovery, things like that. Um, not too far away. I had my choice of which ones I could go to spaghetti dinners, breakfasts with all sober people. Um, and then I got down here and I was like, it's rough. It's hard. You can go 22 long. miles to a 12 step meeting. I've, I've just been back here for, I left here in, uh, Oh, 89, 90 to go, go off to seminary. So we were gone from this here about 25 years, came back. Uh, and even in my 15 years back pastoring here, um, I have seen the church doing recovery quit. And now that's over here. I've seen this church, they, the vine was on it and th then they got in trouble with it. You know, th those groups are difficult to manage because they have people with problems. And, and, and then now, now it's over here, it's a love and truth or it's over here. And now it's at the cornerstone. And it's like, it, I have to call regularly and go, where is the newest recovery yeah. thing going on? Right. It moves. It's, it's, it's hard to find. Right. Yeah. And there's been times when we have almost none. So, Part of the reason why it moves like that is because when we when we get involved in having these ministries, we have a certain expectation. That They're we, messy. That we have an expectation <laughs> that's going to come. 
we we expect results. Right. What we don't expect is that the problem never goes away. No. And that's what happens when we talk about substance use, especially when we talk about chronic homelessness. We can pull everybody out of the river that comes downstream at us, and somebody's still falling in the river upstream. That's right. We will never be rid of these problems. Jesus even spoke to that, how we will always have these challenges with us. We just have to be able to, to build better supports to be able to. Because every new out. person has their own free will to decide. And yeah. there's always, you're not going to eliminate it for people yet. Everybody right. has to make their own decisions. Yes. Right. So, so uh, one of the things we talked about earlier was the difference between mental health and behavioral yeah. health. And I think that's what Crystal's kind of speaking to right there that need to learn a new lifestyle, that need to learn a new way of living. So, let's bring it back to something that we do all know a lot about here in this space, and that's sin. Right. So what do we do when an individual has come to the cross, they've been radically saved and radically delivered, and now they come back from the altar? What do we do with them then? We disciple them. Absolutely. Teach them how to lead a new way of life. And start them on a process of growth. At the core of what we do at Take Action Today, we are a discipleship program. And I could see that that's at your where gala. we got our I, idea That's from. what was so evident to yeah. me at your gala, when I could see the core group that had just come through, then your next group, and this group had been so long, and yeah. you could hear, and you could... Not only could you hear it in their testimony, yeah. you could see it in their bodies. Yeah. Because you could see the damage that the lifestyle had done to them, mm -hmm. but you could see the levels of recovery yeah. and how the lights were coming back on and hope was alive again. Absolutely. So many times when we talk about things like this, so much focus is on the goal, sobriety, or whatever outcome we hope to achieve. It's reaching that goal. But what we focus on at Take Action today is the process. I just wrote that. We focus on getting that individual <laughs> from a crisis right. to stability. Because we're life. all in a process. Everybody's yep. walking. Yeah. And and even the best guys can take a can take a left turn any yep. day, right, right turn. So it's the process. What keeps you on it? Yeah. And that's where your the whole concept of, of peer recovery does. You've got somebody's walked ahead of you a little bit. Yes. Now I, I want to ask this, and and I want to. Oh, that's a bad thing here. I will give me one second. Let me ask a follow up question while you're doing that. So, Crystal, when you think of like when we think of recovery, a lot of people look at it as just recovery from substance abuse. How would you define recovery? Well, I had to learn. You know, I said I came from a 12 step group, so I was just taught that abstinence was the way that I was going to heal. Uh, so I followed that instruction because I was finally sick and tired of being sick and tired. So coming down here to Southern Illinois and learning about all these other pathways like Medicaid assisted recovery and celebrate recovery and refuge recovery and all these other things, I had no idea, you know, that those were a thing. Um, and like I said, if they were there, I just went right to the group and stayed there. Uh, so I too had to open my mind. Um, Samsha has the definition about recovery is now is a process of change. Um, um, and then eventually you get to what is your quality of life. Um, so for me, like I said, I could have stayed miserable and just not use substances, but I would literally have still been miserable. And so I'm grateful that I, um, the layers of the onion, you hear that a lot in clinical and non-clinical. Yeah. I had to work through facing that trauma, facing uh, some of the childhood pains, facing some of the choices I made that were my fault, but I had someone to hold my hand and walk me through it. I had a, a team, a hope team, let's just say. So is it more than just recovery from substance abuse though? Yes, yes. So I had to deal with my trauma because I found out that was still keeping me sick and that's probably why I didn't want to be in reality. I also had to learn to make more different choices, like I said, um, you know, I found that I was dating um, men that were trying to fill the void of my dad being gone, um, you know, and who knew? And then here I had a relationship with God, but I was raised Catholic, and I'm going to tell you I'm grateful that it taught me about Jesus. However, it also that also was a bit traumatic because when I was at my lowest of lows and, and, and knowing I was going to sin again, uh, I stopped asking God to forgive me because I knew I was going to do it again. Um, I grew up with a, a, a fearing God, basically, not a loving and caring God. So I can see today why a lot of people are afraid to come to get that help because maybe they're not ready to hear the God angle. So let me tell you, um, peer services meets people where they're at. And like I said, this took me a while to actually grasp the theory because I had been raised with this, this, and this, and you know, you just do it very rigidly. 
And uh, come to find out, peer service is meeting people where you're at. The more people told me you have to quit, the more I was like, I'll do it when I'm ready. Even if I was ready, I wasn't going to give them the satisfaction that I quit, you know, because they asked me to. So if we have found that evidence shows, and just the people we've served at TAT, evidence shows that meeting people where they're at, letting them make the decision, like, I think I'm ready to work on this, but maybe not that just yet. And saying, okay, that's fine. Seems to, we seem to be more successful than saying you have to do this or else. Um, we have people who have worked with clinicians as well as with uh, our peer services who have actually opened up to us and said, well, I haven't told my counselor this because I'm afraid they're going to yell at me. Or I haven't told my and we church talk, And we talked about yeah. this in the other episode. The clinical side is the yeah. professional, the yes. doctor, the, 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 yeah. the licensed counselor. And we tend to see them as the above us not yes. to peer at us. Yes. Uh, I had a great question that came in from our social media. Uh, our social media person said there there's help with behavioral health. Uh, any help with mental health? Well, mental health is inside behavioral health. It's a bigger subject, but do you guys both provide peer counseling and at times go, uh, this person's going to need maybe some professional services over here, here. And you, do you network with those things? Absolutely. We do. Yeah. Yeah, 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 because we're just a part of, we're just a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece of a whole, yeah. a total yes. holistic in Christ. Yes. yes. But the one thing I, we were asked in the previous episode, you are faith-based. Yes. Okay, so I'm not a Christian, though. Yeah. I, I show up at one of your recovery centers. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I don't have a friend in Jesus yet, but I've seen some of your friends going around here. Will you take me as I am and, and just let me start on the process with you, knowing that I, I, I hope I, I would hope as a pastor that they would meet your Jesus along the way yeah. because they're one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Right. And we all know ultimately hopes in Christ. Yeah. If you don't have that, ultimately you will even at every box of cereal, you'll be disappointed that there's not something <laughs> of substance. There. Cracker Jack box used to have something in it. You'll find out there's not. So if somebody doesn't have a faith curriculum, can you start where they are and work them forward? It, or, or, or do you have to have, I, I went to Christ, Catholic university with Christian brothers where they'd slap you on the hand and they would smack you, you know, do, do, do you smack people if they're not being properly religious? How do you deal with that person? No, you, you have to meet people where they're at, because like I said, the more that they're resisting, you're not going to make any progress. So today I no longer just say the 12 steps are the only way to recover because I have seen people's lives changed by using other paths. Sure, absolutely. And and yes, so if that's not where you're at right now, that's okay. What do you want to work on? What What is it that you want us to help you with? I would hope that just the way that we treat people and help them and show them love and care and compassion and let them know that there is hope, eventually they will just see that and hopefully say, wow, you're really happy. And like, what does that for you? You know, and let me mention one more thing. So I have some friends who are very, I would like to say religious versus spiritual. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a denomination. Um, I am a child of God. I have a relationship with God. um, And that is the void I had been trying to fill all my life. Like I said, these are Because religion will not fill the void of Jesus. Either spirituality doesn't fill it, personal, I guess... The word you used in the first episode was that you you work on building them back into community, yeah. a community of yeah. faith. That's the name of our church. I'm not mm-hmm. promoting yes. our church, but but community is assembly sure, yeah. or common unity. But but the the rat paradise work when they formed a community, yeah. and so the 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 best community is found yes. in, in in Christ family. Yeah. But you got to find that um, in a paradise, not uh, in a religion. Right. Yes, and so for me. I don't want to be that person by saying, uh, say somebody comes and it's an AA meeting and, and the AA people say, oh, well, you're a drug addict. You don't, you're, you don't have a problem with alcohol. You can't come to this meeting. See, I would rather say, come sit with me for an hour. We don't have to practice any program. Just say, right. connect with me. Just talk with me. That's one hour that that person may not be thinking about. So you're more about death. the recovery it's not the substance, it's the process. Yeah. Yes. Right. And, and so it could be all, so let me ask two follow-up questions. Let me th- let Go me ahead. Something in here real this quick. is a good conversation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. absolutely. So, and this is one of the things that always terrifi- terrifies me about these platforms like this is because I'm going to misquote the Bible. You never want to get caught misquoting. No, right, right. You know, but I believe it was Paul that said that, you know, one man plants, another mm-hmm. man waters, That's but right. only God gives the increase. You're on it. Right? Okay, so who's preparing the soil for the seed? That's so, good. So that's what we do at Take Action today. We do the dirt work. 
we don't we're not trying to get people saved and you might refer things out for some of the other processes yes. right well that's, other so partners that's just, that's just it we're not trying to get somebody saved we're not trying to get somebody into recovery what we're trying to do is apply a little bit of fertilizer, break up the ground a little bit, provide some connection with them. Because only they some, can truly walk the path. Absolutely. Right? And then somebody the else comes along and plants the seed, and then that seed can grow into a good tree. Okay. I, I My producer's telling me I've got really tight on time, but let, let me ask two follow-up questions, and we're going to get out of this. Absolutely. We're going to come back. Don't worry. i got lots of notes here. Mm -hmm. All right. So most people think, commonly people think, a lot of times that person's a drug addict or they're an alcoholic or they're addicted. And because of that, they're homeless yeah. or because of that, they're depressed. You're actually, what you're saying is that it, somebody could have got exposed to something through pain or something, sure. but by and large, the alcohol and the drugs are typically a treatment to something prior to that onion. Yeah. It's typically self-medication, self, self-denial. So you're having to go back and dig out that back, that yeah. back stuff. You know, where they've covered it with this, that's no longer covering. It's actually, it's become worse, you know, yeah. because. And that's it. sometimes why people relapse, because that pain that comes up from remembering that childhood trauma or whatever yeah. might be too much for them and they want to medicate. And that's them. my second question right here. Backsliding. We backslide as Christians. The prodigal uh, father goes to the edge of the property yeah. and waits for us. He loves us. He takes us back. There's no question in my mind that we can come home. Do you know what I say to the person uh -huh. who might have had that slip? No matter if it was a day, a week, a month. Right. If you are still living and breathing, there is a chance that you can still recover. I get good. so frustrated with people saying, I, I was in recovery and I failed, or this, I failed, I'm a loser. Yeah. Are people putting them down? Because everybody sins and falls short yeah. of the glory of God. I, as a yeah. pastor, I, as a husband, have to repent regularly before my wife and before yeah. the Lord for not being a good husband or dad or grandpa this week or doing things right. If I'm going to fail, certainly somebody carrying five bags yeah. into the fire is going to fail. Yeah. So it's not the falling back. It, the Bible says though a righteous man falls down, he yeah. gets back up. That's so the, the question is, are you able to get up? What separates the righteous? I'm preaching now. What separates the righteous from the wicked is not the mistake. It's the laying on the ground right. or getting back up. What you guys are there is to have a peer that says, Hey, if you just fell, get up, right? I fell too. get yes. up. Yep. Yes. Let's get moving. Yep. Yeah. And, and you can learn from that what what triggered that. If you if you learn what triggered that fall, you're stronger next time. Absolutely. I got to quit this episode. This is too good. <laughs> take action today. Go to take action today. We're going to have a third episode coming up here in just a next episode. You don't want to miss it. Go back and watch part one of this. Uh, take action today. It's in our whole series we're doing on uh, uh, taking it to the streets spotlight. Go to takeactiontoday.net, facebook.com, backslash tat.net southern so dot i l check that out in our descriptions we would love to tell you about that we are going to dig in in episode three we're going to look at the challenges and your next moves but before we do that i'm going to make you go through that list we're going to talk about each of those programs real quickly because i want to make sure that we hear from the executive director and the director of operations we want to hear what those programs are so people know the breadth of what you're doing right now and not only can they come and be a part of your services maybe they're in recovery and they need, they would like to be trained to be a peer counselor i don't even know how you do that you got to tell us how we start that process so we need to learn a little bit about how somebody could get into that process that has a real story how do you vet them how do you get them started we need to write that down for the next episode and then what i want to talk about is your dreams for the future and uh, what, what what i just want you to be a little bit of a prophet and see what do you see next but the challenge is what i mean is i mean southern Illinois is some hard ground right now mm -hmm. and um, i just want to hear about uh how's the mental welfare of southern Illinois right now is it is it, is it take action today's been here three years is it improving are you just identifying more holes and and where are things going so we're going to kind of be a little bit prophetic uh and kind of address it and, and then kind of help people get help in the meantime, go to donate at takeaction.net uh, and give them a gift. Help out. Reach out to them. You can reach out to them not only that way, but you can go and email them, recovery at Take Action today. They would be glad to meet with you. Uh, go go we'll meet with them. That'll be in our description. You'll check that out. And we'll be back for Challenges and Moves in Part 3. I, go to onthedoc.org. You'll find all these links. Email us at info at onthedoc.org if you need, have any questions you want to ask. And you can watch all of our shows on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Facebook, Roku, Rumble, and ServerNet. We beg you, go to YouTube. Hit subscribe, like. We get more. They like it. The more we get, the better it gets. Spotify, iTunes is good as well, but you don't get to see our faces. You want to see our faces. But if you can't, watch us in the car. Watch us on your podcast. And if you hit subscribe, like, it'll tell you when we upload 
every time. You get automatic downloads. It's great. Go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, Getter. If you've got a story like this, if you've got something to testify, if you want, if you want to share your experience, let us know it. Tell other people how you're in recovery, what, what it's done for you. Maybe you need to find a way to recovery and you're looking for somebody to partner with you. Reach out to us here. We'd love to help you on the dock. We'll get you connected to somebody. We'll get you connected to Pastor Dan. Pastor Dan goes to church with us here and we'll get you connected and he'll help find a resource in your area to help you because we have people listening from all over and there's, there's other networks out there. Subscribe, hit like, notify, tell other people about it. Go to my Patreon and we might get Donna back on the air. Hashtag Donna. Back. Hashtag bring back Donna. Bring back Donna. Go to my Patreon, become a partner, four levels of partnership, five, 10, 20, $50 a month. You can be a partner of this show and help us put out more product and get Donna back on the air. We'd also <laughs> love to have your sponsorship. If you're an organization, an entity, a business, Christian owned, we have different levels of sponsorship and things we'll do with you. Go to on the doc.org and you can find out more about that. And don't forget slnt.com promo code OTD. I hope you watched that episode when we started, we'll be telling you more about that. We'll keep you updated on our new partnership, get you a fair day bag and they will not be listening they can't hear anything reclaim your right to disconnect use promo code otd or use our link there and if you don't have a church home we'd love to have you here at community faith at church if you're near marion southern illinois check us out at coftv.com if you're someplace where there's no churches go watch us online facebook and youtube and we got different broadcast channels go check that out we'd love to have you here 10 o'clock on sunday 6 30 on wednesdays but get in a faith community someplace where they're preaching the word and they're holding the line amen Amen. Amen. Hey, Crystal, it was fantastic having you here. We're going to have you back in episode three. Mike, fantastic conversation. Producers all over me because I burned up time like you wouldn't believe. Dan, thank you for co-hosting with us. You've been I fantastic. Appreciate it. I appreciate fantastic. it. Fantastic. I'm Pastor Troy here, and we are on the dock. We're having a great time. Go back and watch part one, and you don't want to miss what's coming up. Part three, don't miss that. We'll see you soon. I'm Pastor Troy. We love you.